Okay. Um, the people in the room know me. For the old Ines, I'm also known as a cyclist, the director of Southeast European Studies at Oxford, CISOX. And it's a great pleasure for this day today because we've got um, a two panel ahead of us. Uh, and uh, we will be celebrating today because June is the month of uh, celebration for CISOX, it's the birth, the month of the, the birthday of CISOX. And uh, this year we're actually celebrating the 20th anniversary uh, of CISOX in Oxford. Uh, and what better way to do this than have a great panel to discuss uh, contemporary issues that affect our region. Uh, originally, uh, when we were thinking of what to discuss today, uh, we said we have to look at the future, how Southeast Europe looks in the next uh, 20 years. But as you all know, this is totally impossible, not just for political scientists like us, that we can never predict anything at all, but it's absolutely very, very difficult to predict uh, anything in the future especially if you are under the circumstances that we are today. And then we thought we have to discuss then the current challenges in Southeast Europe. Now, before we start, and I kind of uh, take you through our program today, I would uh, like to welcome the people uh, who have been associated with us that came here today uh, to be present in this uh, uh, panel discussion and uh, also the current CISOX people. I'm not going to introduce uh, anybody or mention names because many of them will have the opportunity by participating in these panels uh, to uh, uh, kind of present uh, their work and themselves. But um, let me go uh, through uh, the program uh, as we are starting with uh, a film. So we've got a world premiere for you, which is a film on CISOX geopolitics and uh, a little bit of a peek of uh, what we do with our seminars and what are the issues that we are addressing in the field of geopolitics. I have to say that that film was done during the pandemic and uh, we kind of uh, dragged it a bit longer to bring it into the anniversary uh, year. And it's done by our uh, friend and the collaborator in our diaspora project, Nikos uh, Stamboulopoulos. After we watch the film, I will hand over to David Madden uh, who will introduce very briefly the panel, the first panel, which will be about <coughs> Southeast Europe in the shadow of Ukraine, of the war in Ukraine, but from the enlargement perspective. The European Union has always been our point of reference. We at CISOMS want to be romantic and idealistic and believe that the EU still has a transformative uh, power uh, over countries that want to join or have already joined. Uh, that's debatable, but in any case, we are discussing because the enlargement is having a new kind of momentum, given that uh, uh, three countries from the uh, Eastern Partnership uh, have uh, uh, asked to become members. Uh, then we've got a break, half an hour, and then we go back to discuss more security questions, but at the same time, country perspectives, and this is what we have been doing very well at CISOX, I believe, because we've got those thematic issues, but at the same time, we do bring the country perspectives as we are a, a group of people also coming from different parts of, um, uh, of uh, Southeast Europe. And then uh, after that, uh, you will allow Julie Adams, the CISOX administrator, and myself to indulge a little bit on the CISOC success story uh, with another film and a little bit of information on the years that have gone by. So happy birthday, CISOC. Let's watch the world premiere and then we'll go to our discussion. Thank you all for being here. More than 30 years since the fall of communism and one generation since the Yugoslav conflicts of the 1990s, the region of Southeast Europe faces numerous security threats, some of them in the form of frozen conflicts and border antagonisms, while most of them the result of the new geopolitical realities and competitions of the multipolar system. 
Drawing on its expertise and networks, CISOX is participating actively in the debates on regional geopolitics and geoeconomics, looking into how the countries and the peoples in Southeast Europe have been responding to such challenges and how external players may be upsetting the regional delicate balance. Through seminars, brainstorming meetings, workshops, reports, and blogs, CISOX is engaging with the most relevant challenges, ranging from the frozen regional conflicts to cybersecurity, organized crime, migration, misinformation, radicalization, and extremism, as well as cooperation under NATO and EU enlargement. The region is still bedeviled by some lingering security issues unsolved problems from the post-communist disintegration of Yugoslavia, a dominant issue being Serbia, Kosovo, and the inability to proceed with the normalization between the two. Dialogue would open the door for a lot of other simultaneous relationships to exist between um, Serbs and Kosovars that would help supplement in different spheres, um, you know, the sort of work that, you know, the Regional Cooperation Council does, but on a multitude of fronts. There are also the internal divisions within Bosnia-Herzegovina, one quarter of a century after the Dayton Peace Agreement. Some issues are returning with a vengeance, as in the Aegean, in the post rapprochement period between Greece and Turkey. Security concerns in the region have been heightened by new or more recent issues, including energy, which instead of providing common space for synergies, lead to competition. Cyber security has become a significant threat for the global environment, but the degree to which the region is particularly vulnerable to cyber threats and production of misinformation is an issue of major concern. As for migration, the region is perceived either as a transit through the infamous Balkan route or as a place where refugees are stuck. Some countries are using the refugee issue in order to promote their foreign policy objectives. Similarly, the term reception, it suggests temporality, right? Like if you think about reception, you don't think that you're going to be there for a very long time. But these spaces are only intended to house people for a short period of time. That is true. Like the, these spaces are not built to house people long term. But the reality is that since the EU Turkey deal, and here we then see the, that the role of policy in crafting certain spaces, people spend multiple years in these spaces. People on the islands of Samos, Lesbos, Chios can find themselves there for 18 months, two years, or longer. These spaces were not designed or built to cope with long term residency. Connected with all the previous themes, it is often asked whether radicalization <coughs> is something particular in the region or a part of a wider European and global phenomenon. In my view, the war was just a condition. The, mo the most important thing is basically the post-war period. The moment when we do have identity crisis, we have fragile or absolutely destroyed, uh, let's say, welfare system, poor education, no access to any kind of opportunities for, for young people. So basically the idea is that this, this fragility period <clears throat> managed to, to become a permissive factor for external foreign actors <clears throat> to uh, to come to these fragile societies and uh, take advantage of, of, uh, the, of the, the situation and to spread radical norms. The role of agency in the changing geopolitics is pivotal, and CSOX has been looking at the role of the most influential actors in the current multipolar <laughs> world. The role of the EU is assumed to be the most influential, but how sustainable it is is an important question at a time of enlargement deadlocks and procrastination. The Western Balkans will need to start acting as equal partners. They need to stop thinking in terms of we need to do our homework in order to get a treat. They need to start thinking in terms of we need to deal with challenges that we're facing, we need to engage, and we need to cooperate, not only when the EU tells us we need to cooperate in this field, we need to look at what our challenges are and ask the EU to cooperate in the areas that are important to us so that we can resolve those challenges. The role of NATO is absolutely fundamental in the region. <laughs> in recent years, the transatlantic partnership was not consistent on the messages it delivered to Southeast Europe. Faced with Turkey's challenges, the disagreements between the EU and the Trump administration, 
and NATO being questioned by its member states. It is also clearly understood that the weaker the position of the West, the stronger the role of other actors. CSOX looked at the actions of Russia and of the Russian Orthodox Church. So with the occupation of Crimea and the creation of a whole variety of new bases, the resuscitation of Cold War era bases, an extension of modernization, new, tech, new military technology, and the effort to try and sustain a permanent naval presence in the Eastern Mediterranean in support of uh, Syrian operations. Um, the Black Sea becomes now an interconnecting zone between these two uh, strategic areas of concern. And that means that there are more points of potential friction uh, with NATO and NATO states in particular on the Black Sea coast. The role of China is very different in terms of approach and defense. The countries in the region are diversifying their sources of finance. They're reaching out to China, which they had not done 10 years ago, in some cases, not even five years ago. They're moving away from an exclusive focus on Europe. So that's a diversification in one direction, but it actually works both ways. And I'd like to highlight here something that is increasingly an issue in the region, and that is that Chinese companies are bidding for EU projects and are winning the tenders. Russia's invasion in Ukraine, the scale of the war and destruction, and the uncertainty that dominates the world have intensified all these regional geopolitical and geoeconomic trends and risks. In the current insecurity environment, Southeast Europe has a dual role to play. On the one hand, as lessons learned from the region's own conflictual background and the humanitarian, socioeconomic, and political aftermath that we take in the future three years to come. On the other hand, the risk that the region might become a proxy battleground of hybrid warfare between the West and the rest. Geopolitical analysis has been one of the principal objectives at CISOX as we celebrate this year in 2022. The 20th anniversary since the beginning of our regional program at the University of Oxford and St. Andrews College. Through all these years, CSOX has consistently engaged with all the ups and downs of a global environment and its impact on Southeast Europe with one constant. The region retains its worldwide significance as a microcosm of many positive and many negative trends that can happen anywhere, being at the same time. Europe's weakest periphery, as well as a strategic crossroad for many actors competing or cooperating with each other. Okay, uh, we are <coughs> proceeding now with our first panel. Uh, the first one is about the EU enlargement. And uh, we are starting our, um, you can, all of you have got the program here. And uh, uh, Ladislav will be posting the um, the short briefs uh, on the on the website so that we don't lose uh, time in presenting uh, ourselves. Uh, and uh, David, shall we now start with the Michael, uh, who will be uh, kind of uh, um, uh, comparing the uh, policy towards Eastern partnership and the enlargement perspective uh, for this region and uh, what that means for the Western Balkans. So, Michael, over to you. Uh, seven minutes each, please. Uh, Michael, you can have eight or nine minutes as you are uh, our guest uh, today, but no more of this because we are in the first with time. And, uh, uh, and then we will uh, move to the next one. So, Michael, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sorry not to be with you in, uh, in Oxford, uh, but greetings from Southeast Europe since I'm on the Croatian island of Brach at the moment. Uh, I'm invited to speak to uh, the EU's reaction to the Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgian applications for membership. So I'll start on what we see, uh, what we know uh, so far. Three opinions from the Commission are expected next <laughs> week, and so on into the European Council, which will meet on the 23rd of June. Uh, dealing also um, with the Western Balkans. In the meantime, Presidents Macron and Michel have been making <coughs> speeches 
um, Macron uh, opening up the agenda, favoring creation of a new organization, which he would call the European, Ge European Political Community, uh, followed by Michel a week later, who uh, wants to call it the European Geopolitical Community. So they all seem to be um, in the same waters there. However, Macron is more ambiguous than Michel. Michel says this new organization should be definitely complementary to the accession procedures that would go on, whereas Macron is not so clear on that question, and some people suspect that he is viewing it as an alternative. Of course, that's a very high voltage uh, political issue, which will have to be clarified in, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, also on the table, in particular for the enlargement process, are cl claims or requests or pressures to reinvigorate the process somehow, given that it is stagnant in the Balkans. And for, this, for that, uh, we um, at SEPS in Brussels, together with the Center for Economic Policy Center in Belgrade, we formulated a template for staged accession to the EU, which um, seems to have been getting some traction in official circles. We have to see how far um, in due course. Um, I'll say a bit more about that later if I have time. Um, so overall, 23rd of June is heading for our leaders to solve a quite complex simultaneous equation that is Western Balkans and TRIO, it's the accession procedures and a, and a new wider European uh, organization. Now, um, um, on our part, SEPs here, since we can't say more for what the officials are going to decide, um, we have put down some markers ourselves on these three East European applications. Um, given that all of them in our analysis may be rated quantitatively with respect to all of the chapters of the accession procedures to be roughly in the same ballpark as the existing uh, for candidate states of the Western Balkans uh, and way above the two not yet candidate states, Bosnia and, and Kosovo. Um, right now, but let's go into the, the three cases um, one by one. U Ukraine, of course, the war uh, adds a political moral obligation to support uh, these people who are laying down their lives for our political values. Um, uh, of course, we do not know what um, kind of Ukraine will come out uh, of the um, war. And some people might say, shouldn't make commitments until we see that. But that's not the position that I think many of our leaders and we ourselves would take. Now is the time to strengthen commitment and for the funding of the very expensive reconstruction to go ahead with ideas already under consideration for the expropriating Russia's frozen assets to pay for it to some degree. So yes, for candidate status in our book, um, now without delay, uh, leading on to initiation of regular accession procedures with no shortcuts, but uh, still get on with it. Moldova also, we advocate accession uh, candidacy status right away. They're very vulnerable, of course, it, particularly if Russia pushes further down the Black Sea coast. Their economy remains weak, but politically we've seen remarkable advances in uh, Moldova over the last two to three years. First getting rid of their ruling oligarch, and then uh, Maya Sandu won the presidency, followed up by and consolidated with the parliamentary success. So they have a really uh, the best possible government one could wish for from uh, Brussels standpoint. So lots of problems still, but yes, for candidate status for them also. <clears throat> now, Georgia. <clears throat> Aha. Um, Georgia is a paradoxical case. Um, their economy is uh, 
on the uh, chapter criteria uh, better than the other two. Um, but uh, the state of oligarchical state capture is getting worse, heading towards increasing de facto autocracy and sustained uh, politicized justice, locking up um, opposition um, journalists, for example. Um, so we've had a big, internally uh, in, in SEPS and with our partners and good friends in Georgia, we've been having some very serious arguments about whether uh, this should disqualify Georgia, break them off from the other two and not get them yet uh, candidate status, wait for a more propitious government. Um, that is the view that Stephen Blockmans and I um, have taken in our short paper on, on Georgia. For us, the straw breaking the camel's back <laughs> was uh, in between their act of submission of application and the forthcoming um, commission opinion, they just went ahead and sentenced to three and a half years in prison uh, a, a prominent opposition uh, or critical TV journalist. And this was signaling and confirming in our book um, the leaderships and the oligarchs' dis cynical disregard for the EU and its values and institutions, uh, recalling also their reneging of the precarious political agreement mediated by Charles Michel um, a year ago. So for this reason, for Georgia, we say, sorry, we got to wait. The EU should wait until there's a more propitious political leadership. Final word um, is on uh, the enlargement process, which links to the next uh, session on the Western Balkans, because uh, in SEPs with Belgrade, our Belgrade partners, we've developed uh, this template concept for four staged accession, um, in which there would be progressive institutional funding and functional investment, conditional on a quantification. Um, quantified ratings of all of the chapters uh, of the process. Um, so this proposal seems to be getting traction within our governments, both in the Western Balkans and within the EU. But we have to see whether this uh, becomes part of the package uh, to be uh, decided on the 23rd of June. Thank you. <clears throat> Michael, thank you very much, and thank you for getting us off to an excellent start. And I'd like to briefly apologise, and thanks to Ocon for taking over so, so um, rapidly in my minute of need. Okay, our next speaker is um, Jonathan Shaler, um, and he will be speaking on the implications for the Western Balkans European perspective. With the Western Balkans succession process bogged down, um, how can one square, how can the EU square enlargement fatigue <coughs> an appropriate political response in the Ukraine? A very important question. Of course, Jonathan is well known to people in this room and more widely. He's been at CSOX and ESC for, for several years. Thank you very much, David. Um, when I was preparing this, I thought back to one, my experience of EU enlargements, which I, I, I was, a, as it were, a beneficiary of the EU's first enlargement uh, in 1973, and subsequently I've had some small role to play in all of them since then. And I concluded that in previous enlargements, in two cases, 1973, in 1995, those enlargements were driven by a clear economic rationale. We were dealing pro primarily with Northern European countries. But that the others, Greece in 81, Spain and Portugal in 86, uh, 2004 and 2007, the 10 Central, Europe Central and Eastern European countries and the Mediterraneans, 
and Croatia in 2013 were all driven by a geostrategic imperative, essentially where the EU member states sought to support the consolidation of democracy. As far as the Western Balkans is concerned, the Thessal I looked at the Thessaloniki summit declaration from 2003. We were discussing this over lunch, David. Um, it was, I think, the high water mark of the 1990s geostrategic imperative for further enlargement. The Treaty of Athens had just been signed, admitting the 2004 acceding countries, and there was a justified hope that uh, uh, Romania and Bulgaria would sort of soon follow, which they did. And the summit also refers to the ongoing process for Croatia. Um, I think by the time Croatia's accession occurred, it perhaps represented the last gasp of that geostrategic imperative. I mix my metaphors. Um, since then, we have seen the global financial crisis alongside domestic problems within, within the EU, many of which have been ascribed to the, to the effects of the 2004-2007 enlargement. And as a result, although an accession process has begun in the Western Balkans, we have seen a story, enlargement fatigue, as you mentioned, David. So that the grandiose pro promise made at Thessaloniki that the stabilization and association process and the prospects it offers would serve as the anchor for reforms of the Western Balkans has rung somewhat hollow on both sides. Later discussions will go into some of the details of that, but I think if I were to try to describe the process over recent years, it's along the old communist idea of the U European Union pretends to negotiate session and the Western Balkans pretend to reform. <laughs> uh, the question now, of course, is whether Russia's invasion of Ukraine and Ukraine's consequent application to join the EU, which Michael has talked about, creates a new situation encompassing the Western Balkan accession process as well, and I think it does. Um, what, assuming that Michael is right in what he says about the EU's reaction, and I, I would share his view, uh, what does that mean for the Western Balkans? And I noticed that some EU member states, uh, recently the Aust Austria, the foreign minister, said that what West Balkan member states' aspirations should be considered an equal priority with Ukraine. I'd perhaps argue even a higher priority given how long they've been waiting. But uh, he added significantly that enlargement is not a legalistic bureaucratic approach, it's a geostrategic instrument. And it is clear that in the absence of progress on enlargement and the backsliding, Russia, exercises a destabilizing role in a number of countries in the region, which can only really counter if it, the accession perspective is seen as credible. And at the same time, under the pressure of the UK, Ukraine crisis, we're seeing the Central and Eastern EU member states exercising a greater role in EU policy making. The Franco-German locomotive continues to play a major role, but their long-standing not always very hidden reluctance to make progress on enlargement may become unsustainable. It's hard to know. But the current enlargement process can't simply be accelerated willy-nilly in the absence of reforms in the Western Balkans. Uh, and this is, I think, the dilemma. And simply to ignore the issues which are still present in the Western Balkans would risk creating an impossible situation inside a further enlarged European Union. The cases of Hungary and Poland are proof of what uh, can go wrong. So my conclusion for what it's worth, we need a rapid rethink of the European Union's approach to Western Balkans accession, which could of course also be transferable to Ukraine. 
there are ideas on the table and Michael has referred to them. Uh, there is support, as he has pointed out, Italy, Austria in particular have been supportive. And he's also mentioned some of the other ideas put forward by Macron and Michel. Are they actually realizable? And are they sufficiently attractive for the candidates to serve as the anchor, which was promised in Thessaloniki? Because if you don't have the anchor for the reforms, you're not getting anywhere. But I believe we are now faced with a new geostrategic imperative, a, a Titan vendor, not quite the same that Ch Chancellor Schultz was talking about. I hope, I'm not confident, but I hope that EU policymakers will have the courage to seize the initiative and run with it. If they fail, then we do face continuing and growing instability in the region, an economic stagnation and a further brain drain towards Western Europe. Jonathan, thank you very much for a very authoritative presentation. Thank you, Robert. Um, We now turn to Ellie, who is sitting right next to me, um, who joined the Department of Politics and International Relations at Oxford in July 2020. Um, Ellie is going to talk about the rule of law, which has been and remains one of the biggest stumbling blocks of enlargement inside the EU as well. Can a more effective way forward be found or developed? perhaps on the basis of the EU's new internal approach to the rule of law. Ellie, over to you. Thank you, David. Um, so while we try very briefly to talk about rule of law, broader implications for Southeast Europe, I'd like to stress that in addition to talking about enlargement in the context of the Western Balkans, I would want to bring in Bulgaria and Romania because they were, let's not forget the original black sheep um, in the fifth round of enlargement. And it was actually with Bulgaria and Romania that the rule of law became an issue that took center stage. Um, so we have seen quite an interesting and remarkable development since then. So to start with, I think it's important to think about how does the EU define the rule of law? Um, and you would not be surprised if there isn't um, a cohesive, coherent, or a single definition of what the rule of the law is. Uh, and clearly it has evolved dramatically since the mid nineties. Um, so the commission has recognized that the rule of law is the backbone of any constitutional democracy, one of the fundamental values on which the union is founded, uh, but also a guiding principle for the union's external action. Um, and interestingly, particularly with regards to the Western Balkans, it has identified um, six elements that are important in terms of promotion of the rule of law. So here the focus is on separation of power, democratic and transparent process, legal certainty, quality before the law, effective judicial review, independent and impartial courts. And then it's very interesting when we compare this approach to the approach that has been developed with regards to existing member states and what is included in the rule of law reports that the commission has published for two years in a row. So there we have obviously the judicial system and its independence. We have anti-corruption framework. We have media pluralism and any other checks and balances. So if we think about it, it's quite a loaded concept. There is a lot of aspects to consider and think about, but in essence, it's about how um, equal, impartial to private interests and whether the state is treating um, its citizens in an equal um, and fair manner. And um, it's very much at the heart of it and we can see and it is um, touching on a number of different aspects. Um, so over the last 25 years, I would say very much since the mid nineties, um, the EU has gained quite a lot of expertise and knowledge in terms of promoting the rule of law. First, um, in terms of the fifth enlargement round, um, a number of important revisions took place since then, um, and now in its ongoing treatment of existing member states. And I would like to highlight some important changes, which I think we should um, be relatively happy about. I mean, I think compared to the fifth enlargement, this was the last issue to deal with, and the last chapters to open, and the last chapters to discuss. And now in the ongoing round with the Western Balkans, the rule of law is very much part of the fundamentals first approach at the heart of the accession negotiation process. So definitely taking center stage. It's interesting that also in contrast to looking at legislation and the creation of different institutions, now the EU is demanding a sustainable track record, uh, but there are also question marks about whether sustainable track record translates into meaningful long-term reforms and results. So there is also this very question, even if you sort of deliver and rule of law reforms, how sustainable are they going to be in the future? 
Um, and also, I think that what the EU has done all the time is address one of the biggest issues as well, the fact of having double standards when it comes to promotion and um, monitoring and evaluating rule of law between candidate countries versus existing member states. Although the issue was again first raised in the scope of the fifth enlargement, it was recognized that the EU doesn't have competences in this area vis-a-vis -vis existing member states. Um, it required certain reforms to be delivered and, um, by uh, candidate countries. After that, uh, when Bulgaria and Romania became the only two member states to be still monitored on a regular basis in the areas where there had been a key trans, uh, a tracing progress um, in judicial reform and fight against corruption, many Eastern Europeans again felt that this was double standards and felt that this was not fair. Uh, or equal, and so we are very happy to see that the Dutch idea of having CV and Paul has finally materialized in the form of the rule of law reports. So all EU member states are monitored after accession, uh, which I think is quite a remarkable uh, development because before that, the protection of the political <laughs> criteria uh, was not enshrined or there was not an instrument that was dedicated um, to monitoring and keeping an eye on those developments. And I guess that perhaps this is um, when we come to some of the biggest shortcomings in terms of how the EU has promoted the rule of law and the fact that it has at best um, managed to have a mixed bag of results. So I will say that Romania is an interesting and quite remarkable example. If we look at the long term perspective where the country was in the mid 90s and where it is now. And the EU has also considered it to be one of the models in terms of developing institution managing to strengthen the independence of the judiciary and fight and um, high level corruption. Uh, clearly it's not there yet, but I think that if we look on a global scale and um, having the rule of law uh, is the exception rather than the norm. So, I mean, it's a very difficult challenge um, to be achieved in, in the first place. Um, and that's why the key to understanding the success of the EU's intervention is by looking at domestic agency, who and how the EU can empower and how sustainable this empowerment is. So when it provides the sale in the wheels of pro-reform governance, and more importantly, what will be the long-term implications in terms of sustainability. Um, and I will try to perhaps finish on a slightly optimistic note about the future. And this was something that uh, Jonathan also touched on, which I think is very interesting. Um, and it was mentioned, I think, uh, before as well uh, by, uh, by some of the previous speakers. And uh, when it comes to um, agency and owning reforms for a very long time, use interventions were perceived as something that needed to be done to please Brussels. Um, and we can see actually in Bulgaria, but also in Romania, where you have domestic ownership, um, a change can happen, but more importantly, um, European leaders from Southeastern Europe can influence EU's approach. And we have seen a number of proposals tabled uh, by Romanian officials. Um, Makovei was instrumental in driving this agenda in the European Parliament, uh, but also the current Prime Minister in Bulgaria is trying to introduce a number of measures in terms of fighting um, anti-corruption on the European level. And this leads me to the importance um, of leadership from Southeastern Europe and its impact that it can have on European integration, and this is where I will end. Ellie, thank you very much for a rapid counter across some <laughs> uh, complicated territory. Thank you very much. Um, we now turn to, um, to Christian, um, who's um, he's a EFIL student, um, a Barnett Scholar at the Department of Social Policy and Intervention at Oxford University, and a very good friend of CSOC's. And Christian, you're going to um, tell us what are the prospects for resolution of the dispute between Bulgaria and Mas North Macedonia to unblock the way to accession negotiations. Thank you, Dina. Uh, I think it's nice that I'm speaking after Ellie because we heard how conditionality has become more complex and expanded over time. <coughs> However, unfortunately, in the case of North Macedonia specifically, uh, it has also become increasingly relevant because North Macedonia is currently facing, uh, and has been facing for a long time now, a series of political rather than meritocratic obstacles to its, to its obsession. So just to provide some context, even though I presume most people in this room and online will already be familiar with this issue. Um, since 2009, North Macedonia has had a positive recommendation from the European Commission to start accession talks. 
since March 2020. Um, there has been a green light from the European Council as well. And yet, North, Mac North Macedonia is still not negotiating with the EU. Um, the reasons for this have been, as I said, political and numerous over the years. So, of course, uh, first was the, the blockade by Greece over the name dispute, which has now been resolved, which, and then this was followed by a brief um, blockade by France between 2019 and 2020. We're still not sure if we can actually put an end date to that, but formally it seems that we can, at least for, for now, because currently uh, the biggest obstacle seems to be the opposition from Bulgaria. Um, and since November 2020, uh, Sofia has been refusing to, to um, approve the negotiating framework for, for North Macedonia. And Albania, which finds itself at a similar stage of the accession process, uh, has been sort of an innocent victim of, of this situation as well, even though, of course, you, you could argue that North Macedonia is, in a sense, uh, innocent as well. Uh, but in any case, so what is, what is this dispute about? Uh, how has it actually come, to, come into being in the first place? Well, there are two different interpretations there. The first one would be that uh, this is very much a sort of a political invented dispute in the sense that relations between North Macedonia and Bulgaria, two neighboring states, have been relatively stable over time and relatively close. Bulgaria was the first country to recognize North Macedonia, what was then, of course, still Macedonia, um, as an independent country back in 1992. Um, and by that token, we could argue that uh, this was very much something that started under previous government in Bulgaria, led by, by Bojko Borisov, without much anticipation, if you like. The alternative interpretation, however, would be that uh, this was simply a dormant dispute until 2020 and was merely revived by, by the then government in Sofia, in the sense that even the recognition in 1992 that I referred to uh, was merely a recognition of the country, not a recognition of, of the language and the nation. And therefore, this tension has always been brewing beneath the surface uh, in, in Bulgaria and has merely now um, been restored to the surface politically, both, as I said, under the Borisov government, but also currently under uh, the government led by Kirill Petko. And um, in terms of the elements of the dispute, uh, a lot of the negotiations, if we can even call them that, uh, between the countries um, are uh, informal or, or at least hidden from the public. So it is difficult to, to uh, have a clear picture about this. but. The main one is probably is definitely uh, disagreements in terms of uh, the approach to history, and uh, several expert commissions have been set up to try to align uh, history textbooks in the two countries, especially in the events of World War II. Then the second aspect uh, regards the language. Uh, that there are undeniable linguistic similarities between the two countries, but but I would argue, and many people would argue, that, that these similarities have been missed framed by the Bulgarian government as a, as a basis to deny um, the existence of, of Macedonian language as a political category, <laughs> of, as an expression of, of self-determination. And then the third aspect might be less familiar to, to some people, and it, it, and it has been relatively salient recently. There is this shift uh, in, in the rhetoric, at least in the Bulgarian government, away from um, this narrative of you know, Macedonians are uh, appropriating uh, our, our, our history and our culture towards a narrative of human rights. And this re re relates to uh, the more than 100,000, according to some estimates, Macedonian citizens who have received the Bulgarian passport in recent years. Um, Bulgaria is now using this number to claim the existence of a, of a Bulgarian minority in North Macedonia. Even though in, in North Macedonia census last year, uh, the number of self-declared Bulgarians uh, was nearly uh, 3,000 people. So um, it remains to be seen now whether uh, there the request to perhaps um, incorporate this Bulgarian minority into the Macedonian constitution will be something that the Bulgarian government will, will keep insisting on. We can delve more into some possible ways forward uh, from the dispute in the PA if there is interest. But I, I would just like to end by mentioning the EU's role. So there has been a lot of hope on North Macedonia's side that the EU will apply strong political pressure on, on Bulgaria. 
that hasn't materialized yet, even though there have been some, some efforts. Uh, structurally, of course, there is not much the EU can do, given that uh, every member state, as we know, has the right to veto the accession of, of new member states and to block the whole accession process at any stage of the process for, for any reasons, really. So uh, the wording also of some EU officials, both in Brussels and at the national level, has been relatively understanding of some of Bulgaria's demands recently, increasingly so, even though there has been, of course, criticism. So it seems that if, if North Macedonia and its citizens are determined to join the EU, this will probably have to be something to be solved bilaterally between the two countries uh, without much involvement uh, from Brussels. Thank you. Christian, thank you very much for a clear account. Um, we now return to the wonders of Zoom, and we bring in Jens um, for um, his, his contribution. Um, Jens, of course, has been a, a friend of uh, uh, CSOC's, the European Studies Centre, and indeed a personal friend of mine for many years. I think we first met in Thessaloniki rather more years ago than I care to remember. Anyway, Jens, today you're going to talk to us about economic uh, and societal aspects. Thank you. Over to you, Jens. Thank you very much, David. Can you hear me well? Yes. Fine. First of all, happy anniversary to CSOX. 20 years means also you've reached maturity. <laughs> I greet you from Munich, where I am unfortunately professionally bound today that I cannot be with you. Yes, I want to talk about economic and societal aspects, and they relate to what was included in the question. And there I will start with sanctions. How the sanctions affect individual countries in the region, not only Western Balkans, but more generally Southeastern Europe. Now, the Commission has so far adopted six sanction packages, economically, financially, and people-related sanctions. But these have not, and I underline that, they have not been comprehensively adopted nor implemented by all countries in the Western Balkans, neither in Southeastern Europe by all countries. From the outset, for example, Serbia has refused to adopt these sanctions against Russia. And equally, Republika Srpska has refused to join the six sanctions packages against Russia. So we can already start seeing here an element of not only division, diversity, but also increasing challenge regarding the unification of countries in terms of coming into line with regard to EU policy principles. And this past week, we have witnessed, to the consternation of some at least, that President Alexander Vucic and Vladimir Putin from Russia agreed to a new three-year gas deal in which Russia will supply natural gas to Serbia. Hence, they are deepening the energy ties between Moscow and Belgrade. If you look at the agreement in detail, it is quite revealing how it is phrased. The Kremlin said that Russia would continue uninterrupted natural gas supplies to Serbia. And both presidents reaffirmed their mutual determination, I quote, mutual determination, to consistently bolster Russia-Serbian strategic partnership. I ask myself in light of such wording, how will Belgrade in the coming weeks and months conduct the next round of <coughs> EU accession negotiations with the commission in Brussels in light of this bilateral gas deal and the justification for its signatures? As we are observing countries across Europe, in the Western Balkans, in Southeastern Europe, as much as in Western Europe, they are trying to reduce their energy dependency with Russia. And the Serbian government is precisely going in the opposite direction. It is reaffirming, it is reinforcing its energy relationship dependency with Moscow. <clears throat> We have seen with regard to sanctions also that the Serbian airspace remains open for flights to and from Moscow and St. Petersburg. 
But we were reminded just at the beginning of this week that this doesn't automatically mean that the Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Sergei Lavrov, can travel to Belgrade. I found it quite interesting, and this is an unprecedented step, that three NATO members, Bulgaria, North Macedonia, and Montenegro, refused airspace to the Russian foreign minister in order to land in Belgrade. With regard to sanctions, we also have to bear in mind there are carve-outs that continue in the energy sector and in my view should be addressed in a future sanctions package, knowing nevertheless how difficult this is. It means in particular nuclear energy. At present, nuclear energy is not subject to sanctions, in particular the transport of nuclear fuel from Russia to countries like the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, who operate Russian or Soviet-made nuclear power plants. They can continue to receive, with the explicit approval of the European Commission, energy supplies, nuclear fuel from Russia. You have asked me also, what is the Commission doing about that? Josep Borrell has made it clear that the Commission is in the process of adopting, adapting its financial support to the needs of the region. We have yet to see what that means in terms of numbers, in terms of policy priorities. But as Michael has said at the very beginning of our panel, we are wait, awaiting on the 23rd of June some sense of direction there. My concern is that while the Commission is going to emphasize that all the countries in the Western Balkans should commit to European values, to the European sanctions packages, and to European foreign policy principles, there will be outliers. And one collateral damage of such a process, in my view, could be the belgrade pristina dialogue. Let me conclude with regard to some aspects of food security that I was also asked to briefly address. Odessa remains closed, the port. Part of it, part of the Black Sea, is mined. We are in a situation now that food security for countries in southeastern Europe and beyond is becoming a critical issue. And how this can be transported through which ports and if we look at the map we identify ports who are in the process of becoming very strategically important be it the port in Varna or Burgas in Bulgaria the port of Constanza in Romania Kumport in Turkey and the port of Piraeus in Greece but with the exception of the Romanian port in Constanza, what characterizes all the other ports? They are majority owned by China, or China is in the process of modernizing these ports. That means that, as Jonathan has highlighted in his presentation, that the region of Southeastern Europe is subject to new, unprecedented geostrategic imperatives and China is in play in that process, also with regard to maritime transport and food security issues. Let me conclude with a question that keeps me awake at night since the 24th of February. And that is linked to food security. And I do not have an answer yet. Will Serbia, and for me, this is an important test case, will Serbia purchase Ukrainian grain that has been stolen by the Russian army. Equally, the same could apply to Republika Serbska in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Maybe in our discussion, we can find answers because they keep me awake at night. Thank you for your patience.
Well, Jensen, thank you very much for a very interesting contribution with lots of fascinating stuff in it. Thank you very much indeed. Um, right, and for our sixth and final panelist in this, this part, we turn to um, Calypso, who needs absolutely no introduction from me in this room, in this building. Um, and you're going to revisit our old friends, democracy and backsliding. Um, <laughs> above all, David, I'm revisiting my old friends here and also <laughs> coming back. Uh, it is really wonderful uh, to be here. And uh, Jens, you just said that we at CSOC have reached maturity, but when I was hearing Othon earlier speak about how romantic we are, I, I think we're kind of eternal adolescents, really. Um, and, and that you know, uh, including on this topic of enlargement, we, which we have kept on the table since the very beginning, as you were saying, Othon, and as David and all of us here have been revisiting this topic from the very beginning. This is why we created CSOX 20 years ago. Indeed, um, as good academics, we wanted to analyze, weigh the factors, but at the end of the day, there was a, an advocacy dimension to this program and to this day, uh, it was indeed about pushing back against all of the kind of old Charlemagne mythical ideas of closed Europe that is the German Franco axis and let's not enlarge it too much. You know, it, it, it's fascinating how, how much the world has changed and yet since these underlying um, tensions and tropes are, are still with us. So in some ways, tout ça change. Um, but I guess, you know, the, now the film on geostrategic that you showed at the beginning on, on the geostrategy of the region also reminds us what Jonathan echoed right from the beginning, because I'm not, David, really want to, I did, I told often, I'm not going to think about any topic. I just want to, a few remarks on what I've just heard everyone say today, so we can quickly open to, to the discussion. So, and Jonathan, um, you reminded us that the geopolitical lens was with us, you know, in the 90s. That's what an argument at the end was all about. It wasn't that rational. It was about doing a, a maybe normative entrapment, but in any case, driven by a geopolitical um, uh, drive to unite Europe in, in the world and vis-a-vis -vis the post-Cold War. Um, but I think that kind of geopolitical drive was quickly overtaken by technocratic eco political economy concerns on all sides and reality. And Eddie has spoken to, to elements of that. And that we at CSOC, I'm sorry, this is going to sound like a kind of like ad for CSOC, but we also steadfastly kind of kept on the geopolitical lens uh, when nobody was really focusing on it talking about the triangle within which um, Southeast Europe was embedded in the world and how uh, we always needed to weigh issues of security and insecurity. So, you know, yes, geopolitics has always, this has always been about geopolitics, but I think what we're seeing now is, well, everybody saying so, and for good reasons, because of the war in Ukraine, and that's where we are today. So part of our conversation has to do with the new geopolitics of enlargement. Uh, what does it change when it was kind of always there? Um, and the politics of energy transition, as uh, Jens was just talking about, um, are very much you know, now at the forefront of all this. Um, and, and I think that we're gonna, we're gonna see much more of this because Jens, you were talking about, you know, the exception that is the Balkans, well, and that's a problem in the thorn of, of the EU, but let's not forget that the recent, last week's agreement, you know, we had Hungary and Bulgaria actually uh, asking for an exception to, that was feasible because the pipeline for Russia is divided in two, and so it's very practical, we can break up one of them, keep the other, and that's within the EU. Um, so the, the fact of it is the EU is always going to um, accommodate dissent to the extent that it's possible within this geopolitical calculation. And the question for us becomes whether, you know, the case we can continue to make 
for the re the region, the south, the, the Western Balkans in particular, to, to be in better than out when we make these big calculation and connections between energy transition and geopolitics um, and climate change. And, and here, I think it's fair to say that while the EU is accommodating some dissent within on energy, um, uh, there are lots of conditions, there are budgetary conditions, there are modes of leverage you have within um, that are very different from those without. But part of the question there I would, I would want to raise is that the story of Serbia that, that is being raised raises the question of weaponization of interdependence that we are uh, living in at this moment in time, where um, what we've always advocated is well, interdependence is good, and interdependence with the region, between the region and Europe, will lead to enlargement. That's the name of the game. But at the end of the day, what we're seeing today is that. Um, that quality of interdependence has been questioned by the sanction. Uh, the fact that interdependence can be used in both directions. You can use it to say, well, you know, we can, and I, I'm totally for the sanctions with Russia. But if you have a relational understanding of international relations, uh, it is problematic to see a world where uh, we might get to a state where there's no interdependence at all. Uh, then what kind of leverage and um, how, how do we use our relations to make progress in, in that world? I just want to raise that question. Um, and that brings me to, you know, the final point I want to make is that the question we're raising here and now is what Michael started us with. Um, that is, in some ways, the the question of accession of the of the Western Balkans and Southeast Europe um, is reconfigured by these new by these new candidates. And what does it do to who qui bono? Who has an interest in this linkage and framing this linkage in different ways? Uh, Michael, you know, gave us this the world divided in two. We have the stallers. We have the Macrons of this world, backed by Michel and most of the institutions, who uh, continue to suffer from enlargement fatigue. And they, they are going to clearly, in fact, use this new enlargement to continue to stall, but putting, as you were saying, Jonathan, all those countries in the same bag. And everybody agrees that Ukraine is, whether we give it candidate status now or not, in Moldova and Georgia, with all the differentiation Michael was talking about, whatever happens to candidate status, they're not gonna get in for 10, 15 years. So the more you can lump all of the countries in the same bag and frame that narrative, the more you can have force in pushing back uh, for the Western <laughs> Balkans, even if they have been waiting in the, in, the, in the line for so long, or whatever Turkey, you know, resurrects from uh, the ashes of Erdogan at some point in time. Uh, so there, there is one kind of trope on that side, but of course, on the other side, you have the accelerators, uh, those who, who will use the moral force of Ukraine, et cetera, to accelerate everybody, and indeed make the argument that if we accelerate Ukraine, there is a local, there is some in front, and we have to accelerate enlargement. So they will use those new candidates <laughs> in the other direction. And interestingly, um, the, uh, the Eastern Europeans uh, will have much more of a say than we ever thought before, including because we've had West planning, if we can put it that way, for so many years. West planning for these people who should have shut up and were not listened to, and of course have such bad kids in the EU and with the uh, rule of law these days, but suddenly now they can speak and they have legitimacy to speak. And, and they might use this new culprit in a very different way than we expected before. So one question is whether between the stallers and the accelerators, there is a Goldilocks zone. That's what, we, if not to predict, but as perhaps to prescribe because in, in CSOC we're never hesitating prescribing. Uh, and and so what when we see those forces, how do we 
how do we navigate between those two extremes? And it would be great to hear everyone on this. Um, yes, to Michael, differentiation, graduation, progressive, uh, incremental memberships in various ways in some but not others, differentiated integration for everybody. Um, and, and indeed, coming back to Christian's presentation, uh, in that gradual process, perhaps coming back to some of the intuitions of Ireland and the Northern Ireland that embeddedness in the EU is not just about pressure as you were talking about, but about models, but about uh, different ways in which EU membership can create an atmospheric of conflict resolution that hasn't really been exploited in the region. And we could come back to Montenegro and, and other cases. So there is very much that can happen in this Goldilocks zone. Um, and I would add Ellie's um, story, one which Addis will come back to um, on our second panel, uh, that is that if that the reinvigorating the process of enlargement can help us come back to two questions of double standards, double standards within. Uh, we Yes, Ellie, you're so right that we now have assessment of all EU members when so we can't just go to the to, to the to Western Balkans and say you're the bad guys because we are assessing everyone. But for as I just said, I have looked a lot into you know the the double standards of even making these uh, reports. But we just uh, testified in the European Parliament on this. There is so much to be said for the continued double standard. So if the EU could actually deal with hypocrisy within, that would help. Um, <coughs> And deal with, I mean, Rena was also talking about domestic agency. We've been going on about domestic agency in the, in the region forever, but have we really seen an EU that makes good on claims that we respect and enhance domestic agency? I don't believe so. But finally, there is the greatest embeddedness, which is within the global system as a whole, the re-questioning of the liberal international order, the fact that the global south is pretending to be with the West, but isn't, has been raising the issue of hypocrisy very forcefully uh, in this Ukraine war. And we need to ask whether you know, the EU is capable of dealing with the negative externalities of its policies in general, of the fact that whatever it does, it will create insecurity in its neighborhood. In our region or in the Mediterranean, the EU exports insecurity while claiming to import, to create security in the region. We've always dealt with that tension, but now that tension is really globalized <clears throat> with Ukraine. And probably the rest of the world is watching the EU's attitude to the region um, in asking where, how far this um, double standards goes. So, Let's not forget that the whole overall embeddedness and that relates back to sanctions and many of the issues we've discussed. But wonderful to be here. Calypso, thank you very much. And thank you for gently leading us towards the Q&A session. Um, you used the phrase, an ad for CSOX. Well, I think this event is a very good ad for CSOX. Um, and you know, five of the panelists here um, have a very strong connection with CSOX. Um, and Michael um, doesn't, but I think we today made him an honorary member of CSOX. <laughs> so um, let's, oh, uh, but just as a final word on the, on the bit of the panel, thank you very much to the, the speakers for lucidity and clarity and for putting so many interesting um, and, um, and, and widely fascinating points into the discussion. Right, let's begin the Q&A session. Um, right. Um, Addis, I saw your poll go up. So let's let's start there. Yeah, in the very you. center of the room. It's usually your place. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, thank you very very much for for these uh, wonderful presentations, which really uh, raised a lot of issues. I would like to focus on many of them, but I'll ask one question. I think that it's desirable to Jonathan. I very much agree with you that uh, this could be a tightened uh, kind of moment for EU enlargement, whether it will be or not remains to be seen. At the same time, while we all support, as Calypso said, uh, said in, an, uh, in an advocacy type of 
of setting the, the enlargement towards the Western Balkans, isn't there also a danger of emoting EU membership in a way that uh, of making it a geopolitical handle that it has been or not? Are we not sacrificing some of the values which we have been talking about for 20 years now? It's not just about, about the, the things that you get when you're a member, visa free travel and stuff like that. This should not be, we heard it in the video as well. This should not be the reason why you do this stuff. These things, these reforms are inherently good. And now suddenly we need you and yes, you can come in. So is there not the danger there of devaluing the whole teleological aspect of the story? Not that it is a bad thing to do it necessarily, but isn't that danger there? Okay, thank you very much. Let's take up the second question at the same time. Uh, I also had uh, a lot of questions like I did, but I'm gonna try to stay focused. Um, my, when I look at the problem of reforms in the region and what Jonathan was talking about in particular, um, you know, things like anti-corruption reforms, rule of law reforms, they're not naturally in the interests of Balkan political elites. I think this goes against their natural interests. The only way that they're actually going to engage in these kind of reforms is if there's a real credible, real credible perspective of EU membership, and if the EU is really pushing them very hard in the direction of reforms in order to become members. Do you see any uh, prospect that the EU is actually willing to engage and uh, to actually enlarge and to actually push these countries towards reforms and enlargement? Um, if I could just a small comment to something that Jens said as the, as, as the serve in the room. Uh, I'm, I'm very, I, I wouldn't want Jens to be not sleeping at night. I don't see this risk of Serbia and RS buying Russian or Ukrainian, solar or Ukrainian grain as a real prospect, given that both, I think, are net exporters of grain. Um, well, thank you very much indeed for two very interesting questions, multifaceted. Um, since there was a specific mention of Jens, perhaps it would be polite to, to bring him in first, while the other members of the panel are thinking about their responses to the two questions. Jens. Well, thank you very much for the colleague from Serbia to indeed relieve my sleepless nights. I, 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 I pose the question because uh, I'm looking for a positive answer, and I think mm, you are reassurance that this would not happen and lead in that direction. Um, as regards um, the much larger questions with, that were more addressed to Jonathan and to Michael, I will defer to them. I will only say one thing that concerns me when I look at the proposal that President Macron has made. Now, I don't want to jump immediately into criticizing it. I think he first of all deserves credit because he does something that no other EU leader does. He thinks outside of the box. And this is food for thought, which should be challenging and thus part of our conversation. So he deserves credit for that, even if one doesn't agree in parts of the detail. My major concern is about the fact that how do countries who have been waiting 20 years plus how do they now look at this proposal? Do they see it as forming a permanent second league? Could this be a lower tier of EU integration, a permanent waiting room for EU accession? And I think these are questions that are being asked right now in Podgorica, in Belgrade, or also in Skopje. I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Michael, um, you, you're with us on Zoom. Are there, are there any aspects of the questions you would like to respond to at this stage? Um, uh, uh, I'm really worried about Jens not speaking, sleeping well at night. Uh, and I'm afraid his the things he's been raising, I think, are in the nightmare department rather than the real world department. I mean, you have Serbia buying uh, this wheat from Russia's stolen Ukrainian grain. Well, I mean, Vucic doesn't have to be that stupid. I'm mean, sure he can just go up the road and buy wheat from, uh, from France and the rest of the European Union, where supplies, I think, are reasonably 
easy. Um, and then on the China blocking food exports from Black Sea ports, well, I try to think about what the Chinese would want to do there. I can't see the Chinese wanting, choosing to intervene in a heavy handed way to basically support Russian uh, food uh, supply restrictions. I think they would want to keep out of that. So um, don't worry about that, Jan, <laughs> either of them. Now, on your Macron question, however, <coughs> well, you say you don't want to criticize him now. Let's wait a bit. <coughs> well, that's a polite, uh, precautionary position. Uh, but I would say, uh, reading his speech, what is in it and what is not in it, that accession candidates have reason to be really concerned that he is shaping up as arguing for the new community to be an alternative uh, to accession. I mean, nothing he has said uh, dispels this suspicion, uh, which links through also to uh, the Ukrainian sensitivity to Macron's speech about not wanting to humiliate um, Russia while the Russians are killing us uh, in, in Ukraine. So Michel is far more detailed and more explicit in having a clean separation between the accession process and the new community. Okay, but uh, I would say um, Macron is to be faulted for having um, uh, chosen words that raises these suspicions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. Now, um, can I turn the questions to my learned panel here in the room to my left? Right. Yes, please. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, Anis has asked, is there a risk that we, we overemphasize the geopolitical aspect? Um, and this is, there is a risk of this. Uh, there is uh, enlargement. <clears throat> uh, Schallenberg is right when he says it's not just, well, he says it's not a legalistic bureaucratic approach. It is a geostrategic instrument. He's right in saying that it is a geostrategic instrument. And one saw this with the pressure of the, geo, of the, of the geostrategic geopolitical imperative, which all the member states accepted and followed in their work in developing the accession process through the fifth enlargement. I'm never sure whether Romania and Bulgaria is sixth or second phase of the fifth. Second phase of the fifth, exactly. <laughs> um, and you know, each member state would compete to see how much progress could be made under their presidency. But at the same time, uh, you had the commission the institutions uh, saying, hang on a moment, we're not there. And you can't lose sight of that. This <laughs> thing is the dilemma that we face. Um, so it is, I, I think Schallenberg missed out a conjunction when he said it's not a legalistic bureaucratic, bureaucratic approach. It's not just, or it's not solely a, a, a legalistic bureaucratic approach. It is, a, it is also a geostrategic instrument. Um, but you can't avoid some of the, if you want to call it legalism, bureaucracy. Uh, and this is the dilemma, how do you get past this? And this is why I personally am attracted to Michael's idea of, uh, and, and, and others, Sepp's idea, but uh, I've also seen it with Pierre Mirel, uh, the idea of a staged approach. Um, uh, and you know, so that you can, do some of the geopolitics, geostrategic side, but uh, it has to be seen as a spectrum and not as an alternative of 
gradual of, of progressively moving towards full membership. Now, how you get the balance between the rights and privileges is, is, is quite complex. Um, is there any prospect, says Milos, of real EU engagement uh, to give a credible perspective of uh, membership? I hope so. Uh, and you know we're back to Calypso's dichotomy between the you know can we find the Goldilocks uh, area? But I do think that they're the role of the Central and Eastern Europeans. They will no longer have the occasion to shut up, as, as Shihak said. Um, they will need to push very hard, not stupidly, but. They do need to push very hard to create that real prospect. So, so just a footnote on Macron, because it has been quite discussed in, in France. And first of all, it's absolutely not new. Uh, you know, Mitterrand spoke about the common European house. When was it? 25, almost 30 years ago, you know, and it was exactly, I mean, really fascinatingly, the same kind of language. And the, and the law of the Atlantic and Ural, Communauté Politique, same thing. It's a very, very old French trope. Uh, and, and so, you know, why not revisit it? But let, let's not say it's thinking, I'm, I wouldn't say it's thinking outside the box. But he is trying to resolve, you know, a French dilemma. He, and, and it's interesting that he has to be upfront on everything with speaking very quickly without probably think about all the detail, because if you look at his original speech, it was clearly an alternative. He said that the European Union, the, the <laughs> European space cannot only be structured around the European Union. And when you speak about security, we can, well, we'll agree because there's NATO, there's OSCE. How many organizations are there? And Council of Europe. Of course, the European space is not just structured around the European Union, but, for all of these states, that is what their current, you know, ticket to modernity is. And he's completely, you know, denying that, re that reality, but he's clearly has an, an idea of Europe, which is anti-enlargement, and it was an alternative. But then he was pushed, um, especially after he said Ukraine will wait, will have to wait for the decennia, you know, decades and decades. <laughs> It's one thing to say enlargement takes a long time. It's a different thing in a narrative in the middle of the war to say decades and decades and to think about how you say it. So then he made some declarations which kind of like stood back a bit. You know, no, 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 it doesn't preclude future enlargement, future enlargement, long-term enlargement. So he tried to say something about it's complementary, but at least in the you know in the long term we're not all dead so let's let's not beat around the bush this French idea is very much an alternative and it's an old one but Addis to your question then uh, and why it's problematic is that I mean I my answer to you would be Kant that is and Kant really distinguishes between you know motivation eternal eternal peace you know how do we how do we do the damn thing versus means, how do you get there? And motivation is of the EU and accession in it has to do with ont ontological insecurity of states. And why you create confederations or federation in the first place? Because you have, you, you seek peace or you have an, an enemy and or both, et cetera. And so I don't see what's wrong with reiterating this motivation of Europe, of, of European integration yet again, but in a <laughs> tragic and dramatic <laughs> but that doesn't mean then that then you shouldn't have the conditions you know and Kant spent a lot of time talking about cosmopolitan law and it's all about cosmopolitan how we do it and so how do members of that uh, integration have to fulfill certain condition uh Kantian condition and so I would say that the motivation actually makes it even more necessary to have these underlying conditions fulfilled. So the two, maybe that's too positive a response because then it comes in what you're saying and you're right too, but both things can be right, is that they come into tension because if we're in a rush for geopolitical reasons, we'll turn, we'll, we'll pretend, we might pretend, but that's, that, that will be part of why the game will be fascinating. Thank you very much, Calypso. 
And we've got quite a load of questions lining up here. So I've noticed that the Sveta and uh, Karen, you want to ask questions, um, but I think we need to go out of the room now and we'll we'll take questions um, from Joanna Hansen and, and Dayton. Um, and then we will return into the room and take a question from our fund, and then we'll go back to Jens, who wants to say something say something about China. So, Joanna, would you would you like to come in? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for this great seminar, and of course a very very timely one. And I think looking across the panel, regardless of whether CSOX is a child or an adolescent, I think the panel shows the great range of ages that <laughs> <laughs> so you've looked, we've looked at the problem of North Macedonia Bulgarian relations in the enlargement process and what the problems are there. But I don't think we've really mentioned Kosovo. And there we have Kosovo, which has a stabilization and association agreement. And there we have two very specific, fundamentally different issues. And the first one is that five member states do not recognize that country. And that includes Spain, Romania and Greece. And then the failure to grant Kosovo visa liberalization. You know, the only country in Europe and other countries outside Europe have it. Um, and this creates enormous anti-EU feeling in Kosovo. It's, it's had a really difficult uh, rebound on public opinion and the value of the European Union. So is there any chance, this is my question, is there any chance of reversing these EU approaches? Could it use these, e these issues to have a greater leverage over Serbia? Serbia, Vucic's approach, which was just as stubborn before the Ukraine war. I don't honestly think it's really making, I mean, what obviously Serbia is doing is absolutely off, off the radar, but I don't think it's making an enormous difference to the talks with Pristina. And so, so Christian, you'd have something to say about this with his narrative he uses. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, brilliant. It, they were, I will read out what I said. Those were lovely introductory talks and it's very nice to see um, so many old friends and colleagues uh, still talking about the same old issues about enlargement. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was my dear friend Calypso who said plus a charge and one couldn't agree more. Although the context of course is, is very different. I'm curious to hear from the panel a little bit more about this sense I get from, from these, these interventions about the European Union generating instability and, and insecurity on its margins. And you've talked about the region, of course, but of course you could also say that that was in part also true for Turkey. Um, and now on the French thing, I instinctively feel that maybe the French have got it right this time, unlike uh, Mitterrand, the timing was wrong. And this idea of layers of association, which could indeed be a waiting room um, uh, on, on, on one interpretation and some free trade arrangements, but also a semi-sanctuary for um, countries like the UK eventually, when we get over our own nervous breakdown, um, that we may want to have some waiting rooms on the side and a sanctuary from um, the, the buffeting of the outside world. And, and this really links to the instinct I get from all of you that has the European Union really got the confidence at the moment and the economic growth to sustain an enlargement. It's not really enough to do the Monet method of we'll do it together and see how it goes, it seems to me. And I think you were indicating that. So has it really got a sense of what it wants to do if it has extra members within its community? And just as important, has it really sorted out what this means for the transatlantic relationship and with NATO in particular? Because the two are twins in many ways. And we are very keen at the moment not to destabilize that relationship. So many thanks to all of you. And um, thank you. Do, you. do you direct your question to any one specific member of the panel? I don't think any members of the panel have got any problem at all about picking up whatever 
threads they put to. <laughs> I, I'm sure you're right, but I don't think we have time for everyone to say everything about it. Well, Calypso, Calypso did touch on some of the things I've mentioned, and it's always interesting to hear from her, but it would be uh, interesting to hear from Michael, who I think of as a old-fashioned federalist almost, Michael, um, whether, whether you would take great grievance at the thought of and not a two-tier Europe, because that's very patronizing, but in a sense that there are countries for whom this EU, this mysterious body, is not quite appropriate. Thanks. Okay, right. Um, we've got 15 minutes late, left. Um, Christian, would you like to answer the first question there from Joanna? Um, and then perhaps Calypso, the, the one from, um, from Anne. I think let's let's group the remaining questions and then answer them all in one at the end. Um, Sweta. Uh, thank you. Lovely to be here again. I'll be trying to be brief. The, the discussion moves on between Philip and Andy, so I'll just ask my question and see if that uh, if that moves forward beyond, beyond the Kantian argument. So I was wondering what your thoughts are, whether enlargement is at all a, the appropriate tool, adequate tool to achieve geopolitical aims. Um, the way that it works, the processes, the procedures, the extensive veto powers of everyone around the table. I think this is just a very kind of not very agile tool uh, to achieve geopolitical aims, and, and they use that often what you what you need. But they're trying to be every to achieve everything for everyone, including so transforming political conflicts such as between Macedonia and Bulgaria or Greece or Kosovo and Serbia, mm -hmm. but also being the anchor for reform and the rule of law while ensuring you know, the European security architecture is also protected. Is that kind of undermining enlargement as a as a tool? Can we save can the EU save enlargement from from itself? Thank you, Stephen. Karen. I do have a question. Oh, sorry. Oh, right. I got the, I got the wrong arm. <laughs> Carry on. A question, you know, going back to initial opening remarks by Autumn, where, where would you like to see the relations between Southeast Europe and EU in the 20 years' time? If you were to look at Ukraine as a paradigm shift and, you know, a chance and opportunity to reform certain things. And I, I think certainly question to you, Karim, so. You mentioned Council of Europe and OEC. I think both organizations are in a deep crisis because of the situation in Ukraine. Does it create opportunities for EU to become more proactive when it comes to promotion of certain values, which you rightly said, you know, um, they might create some instability, but I still believe we've been promoting right values. We we're just not equipping our partners with necessary instructions and guarantees. Uh, so the values are still there. Uh, but maybe, you know, the crisis in Ukraine is an opportunity for Southeast Europe. And I would like to ask the panel, in a 20 years time, how would you like to see those relations? Thank you very much. Very good question. Often. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I had a question in terms of uh, those uh, uh, different stories that we you know, get to see in our world today. Uh, I mean, Calypso did mention the notion of interdependence. And I was particularly with actors Calypso and Ellie, and, you know, when you teach your courses of international relations, right, and you are talking about European integration, we should not underestimate the fact that European integration is still going on and that the countries are actually getting together in view of the threat that is coming from abroad. So that's something I believe that we need to appreciate, that the countries need to act together. So there is a togetherness there, but at the same time, the interdependence that doesn't work, for instance, with Russia. So what do you teach, you know, your students? Uh, in terms of these two different theories. Do you go for the, the realist theory and what's happening now with the Cold War and relations between <laughs> Russia and Europe as a dominant paradigm? Or do you go for the integration paradigm within Europe that it is still relevant? I wonder, you know, what kind of approach do you take when you teach your, your, your classroom? Really, is this a question? Yeah. No, right. Um, let's, um, Jens, would you like to say something about China? Thank you, David, for giving me the word. Two aspects. One is, I would have been thoroughly misunderstood if I would see China as trying to block transport of grain in 
southeastern Europe along maritime shores. What I am trying to underline was that China has established leverage in maritime connectivity in the region of southeastern Europe. Food security and energy transport links that now exist will have to consider China as a player in these ports of the region that we are talking about. It's not about blocking, it's about coming to arrangements given that China is an interlocutor in the region for these critical aspects. Briefly on what Anne said, I think we should always bear in mind that while we talk about different aspects of enlargement, its obstacles, there are countries who are gradually also moving further east. Serbia has a free trade agreement with the Eurasian Economic Union, which includes Russia, Bielorussia, Armenia, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. Bosnia-Herzegovina has applied for free trade agreement with the Eurasian Economic Union. If trade integration happens at a, on a larger scale in the Western Balkans with the Eurasian Economic Union, this will have major regional and security implications that we should not ignore while we at the same time discuss EU enlargement. Yes, thank you very much. Christian, would you like to say something in response to Joanna? Yes, so in Serbia and Kosovo specifically, I mean, I'm not an expert in Kosovo, but I, I do some research in Serbia. Uh, I, I suppose Kosovo is, is, a, is a good and very disappointing, perhaps, example and frustrating example in the sense that we have this combination there of some unmet conditions and, of course, huge political obstacles. Although I agree that uh, the fact that there has been no visa liberalization yet is extremely disappointing and, and unfair. Uh, on, on Serbia's side there, I mean, I, I have to, of course, I have to keep in mind that uh, as long as, as Russia is on Serbia's side on this, and Russia is, of course, a permanent member of the, of the United Nations Security Council, now relations between Russia and Serbia have been cooling down recently over, over the war in Ukraine, but it's extremely unimaginable that Russia would change its position on, on Kosovo. And neither, I mean, I don't think we can expect the position of, of those five EU member states that you mentioned. I don't think we can expect their position to meaningfully change either. So maybe in the long term, there is something on Serbia's side there that might, you know, uh, move the needle. But of course, that seems extremely unlikely as well. I will just add that if, uh, if there is any politician for whom I could possibly envisage movement there, it is Vujic, even though it seems unlikely right now, because if you were to make up his mind about it, and if we were to see some sort of Nixon goes to China scenario where Butish, the unlikely progressive, would, would, would try to, uh, to make some compromise happen in Kosovo, he does have, I mean, the extremely strong political position that he is in, and his uh, patriotic credentials certainly would enable him to sort of attempt that kind of pivot, even though it would be extremely unpopular, but I don't see that happening anytime soon. Thank you very much, Christian. Ellen, would you like to say something? Um, I was just thinking uh, if I could quickly jump on some of Anne's comments and a, a little bit about um, geostrategic aspect. I mean, my evaluation in terms of how the EU has handled enlargement, and uh, let's say um, over the last decade, it, it has been very much a strategic miscalculation. That basically, precisely because there has been quite a lot of um, focus on internal politics for a number of very good reasons. I mean, all the crises that you had to deal with, with um, and all the firefighting um, inside of the European Union, um, a very little um, aspect has been paid to the Western Balkans or any geostrategic thinking, to be fair. Um, and I think that this is the reason why we're asking this question, what is the impact or influence of other actors? What is the influence of Russia? What is the influence of China? Precisely because the EU was not interested and engaged enough to put this as a key priority, the integration of the Western Balkans, and to be fully integrated, meaningful partners uh, and members of the European Union. And I, I find this incredibly frustrating uh, because there is the whole narrative about the Western Balkans is how to prevent the Western Balkans from importing instability into a fragile European Union where we have a number of member states fighting all the different issues. And I think that the, the narrative that we could have is all the opportunities that the EU has missed in terms of transforming South and Eastern Europe. I mean, 
trying to imagine how Bulgaria and Ukraine have the judiciary system and um, managed to deliver anti-corruption reports, how prosperous, successful, but much more meaningful and engaged member of the European Union it would have been. And now we see glimpses of that when the Bulgarian Prime Minister says, we don't want to be part of the problem, we want to be part of the solution. Um, and on this note, I think it's incredibly frustrating when you see that we're still talking about the German Franco motor of European integration and, and voices that Eastern European leaders are marginalized on issues like Ukraine. Many have said that Poland was never taken seriously and considered to be too paranoid about the influence of Russia and, and the long term um, the implications this could have in the region. So I think that in terms of yeah, doing geopolitics, the EU hasn't done very much in geopolitics over the last decade. And um, with regard to the Western Balkans, and it's a shame, really. Um, and uh, whether we should have uh, concentric circles or different types of groups before a country becomes a member state, I can see why this might be appealing. And um, if you live in the UK as a, an exciting opportunity, but if you have been a candidate country since 2005, like North Macedonia, this is a threat rather than a, a, a prospect to embrace. So I can see the appeal, but obviously I can see uh, why many of the countries of the Western Balkans would see it as just another excuse while they will not become members um, anytime soon. And yeah. Andy, thank you very much. Right, I'm afraid we need to be drawing to a conclusion. Michael, could, could you make your contribution? I will then ask Jonathan to a brief answer to Svete, and then I will ask uh, Calypso to bring matters to a conclusion. Yes, uh, thank you. I'd like to respond to the question uh, from someone that couldn't see, but it was the uh, lady about two or three questions before, um, which the key words were, does the EU have the capacity and confidence to proceed with enlargement. Uh, my answer to that is really quite explicit. Uh, capacity, uh, economic capacity, these uh, Southeast Europeans are not big. So there's no problem of capacity, economic capacity. Now, the real problem is <coughs> legitimate political concern over how some uh, new member states, uh, Hungary and Bulgaria in particular, have been using their veto powers to uh, damage the functionality of the European Union. Um, and I think uh, many member states uh, will say when talk to them, we don't want more of that. Um, that is what we would risk doing by going ahead these days with either East European or Southeast European accession. So that's a problem, a real problem. Uh, but it still remains open to the ingenuity of the European Union to find a way of getting around that problem. And that is why in our um, template proposal, we have designed something explicitly intended to cope with that problem. Namely, that in a four-stage process, the, the third stage, penultimate, would see a treaty of accession, but with transitional uh, exceptions on the institutional side. That is to say, they would have qualified majority voting power in the council, but they would not have veto powers, and they wouldn't have a member of the commission or member of the court of justice. And that would go on until hopefully the EU itself would move more um, in favor of qualified majority to the uh, reduction of uh, veto power. So that, that would be a way of coping with the problem, which I think whose time maybe comes now and would be really answering the question that was uh, that was put. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, uh, in answer to Svetlana's question, is enlargement an adequate tool? Uh, of course it isn't. Uh, it, 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 we are trying to achieve too much, uh, but it is the tool, it is the principal tool that the EU has. And, you know, maybe we do need 
to look at how we do this, uh, you know, and perhaps along the lines that SEPs are suggesting, perhaps also incorporating some of the elements that uh, Macron is putting forward. But I, you know, what one has reservations, but we do need to rethink. At the moment, it's all or nothing. Um, and if it's all or nothing, recently it's tended to be nothing. I think so. A few final magisterial sentences. No, no magisterial, but a, a bit pessimistic to add, uh, because I, I can't agree with you more, Eddie, that um, there, there is no, the, the region doesn't figure almost in the strategic compass that Borrell just issued, which was prepared in December before the Ukraine war, but was revisited and issued after. And there is like a strategic black hole, the region for the EU, um, for various reasons that we've analyzed over the years here, but it's sad to think it's still the case. Um, and and uh, and so, you know, and capacity, yes, I mean, I totally echo Michael, if the, the EU can, the region is, and yes, I've said this many times, the, the EU has the capacity. Whether I mean to talk about confidence in the EU is, uh, is very an anthropomorphic. You know, there is no there there. There is no EU that has a psychology. There's just a mess of leaders who throw back the table, the hot potatoes at each other in tables. And what we need to do with the region is to simply uh, invite everyone around the table so everyone can both. You know, learn the table manners, speak at table, maybe not have a veto, Michael, but learn to speak, be part of the conversation, be part of introducing new dishes on the table because it shouldn't be unilateral. Uh, and that's an inclusive vision um, of, of the, it's a, the story we need to tell. But that brings me all the way back to Otto's question about you know, integration. And one thing we haven't talked much about, I don't know if we'll come back to this, but is public opinion. At the UI, everybody talk, makes all these analysis of public opinion. And if you look at the change in public opinion with the Ukraine war, there's been much more rallying around the flag, the national flag, than rallying around the European flag. Uh, not, not Almost no increase in support, I don't know, for European army, but increase in support for national defense budget, these kinds of things. We can still ask whether the rallying around the national flag the national changes in the mind of European, the European public. Do they, yes, they rally more of their country, but do they see more this country as embedded in, a, in an EU setting? And that's part of the question, and that really has consequence for us. Calypso, thank you very much. Okay, we run out of time, but remember that we're resuming at 4.30, and that's both for here, people here in the room and for people who are online. So thank you very much, panelists.